Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Karen Doyle, Operations Director of CITAM Europe. Thanks for joining us for today's annual virtual discussion with these fabulous panellists. I will leave the introductions to our moderator, Kasia Jablonska, although I'm sure you probably already know everyone anyway from past webinars and industry events and from, of course, this annual virtual meetup that they do for us. We're scheduled for 45 minutes, which includes time for questions, which Kasia will ask the panellists. So please post your questions by using the Q&A button. As always, the recording of this presentation will be posted onto the members only section of CTAMEurope.com. If you're not a current member, please email info at CTAMEurope.com for more details. Members have access to a webinar industry, an industry webinar once a month, webinars and podcasts from our colleagues across the pond at CTAM US. They're also invited to apply for the week long executive management program at INSEAD. Uh -huh. is live and in person at INSEAD next March. I'll follow up with an email with the registration details in the next couple of days. So I will now hand you over to Kasia and thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Karen. Hello and welcome to our annual roundup of the latest trends and facts in media industry. We are following all the recent industry events our amazing guests include some of the industry's best known names, Natalie Lethbridge, Maria Rua Aguete, Guy Bison, and of course, Jonathan, Jonathan Broughton. We will discuss all the industry hot topics and predictions for the uh, rest of this year. Let's start with FAST. The subject is on everyone's lips. FAST is currently considered one of the most promising revenue models poised to deliver over 1 billion in revenue in Europe by 2027. However, is FAST really such a game changer? And if it is, is it going to positively impact all the European markets? I believe, Maria, you have a couple of slides you would like to show us. Slides about... What are the highlights about FAST? The highlights is... Advertising in general, not just fast, online video advertising is the fastest growing segment in media and entertainment. This year, online video advertising will overtake pay TV revenues. It will be the main driver to grow in media and entertainment, more than subscription video on demand, more than pay TV, more than anything else. So 200 billion this year, no surprise, everyone, including Netflix, they want to get money from advertising. Part of those advertising revenues come from fast, fast services. So Omnia has been the first company putting a value in fast, and we predict in 2028 it will be 13 billion. But again, although 13 billion may look really high, which is a very important number, 11 billion is in the USA. So we have to take this into account. 11 out of those 13 are in the USA. So outside the USA, what is opportunity? The opportunity, again, it's big in many markets, but particularly in the UK, Canada, and Australia. These three countries will represent the other one billion. That means that US and these three countries will take more than 95% of the whole fast market. But there are opportunities outside the English language in other markets like Spain, Mexico, Brazil. They are all France important markets to take into account. So. Again, an opportunity for many companies that they have some library content they're not monetizing, or even companies that they haven't launched video services yet to decide to go on fast services. This can be for social media platforms, for newspapers, for many companies. Finally, because I want to make this short, this is in Eastern Europe. I was at NEM last week, and I saw that in Eastern Europe, fast is tiny, it's 42 million we're expecting in 2028. So when you compare fast revenues what with traditional linear TV advertising, with social video advertising, it is in fact really tiny. So fast is not going to call linear TV. The US is a very different story to Europe. Jonathan will tell us more about public service broadcasters in Europe because here they play a critical role. They're doing really well, so they shouldn't be threatened by fast services. And last one, to put things in context, 13 billion from fast, yes, seems big, but do we know that TikTok will generate 98 billion? 
more than Netflix and YouTube together, many fast services together. So TikTok is still the big giant. Today they publish that not only they have all this money from advertising, in one quarter they generate one billion revenues for consumer spending through TikTok. So again, let's put fast in context. Let's not isolate the topic. And uh, if you have a, a video strategy, also pay attention to other platforms. I think, Maria, you make a very good point there that's uh, very important. Where we've had a lot of conversations uh, about fast, it's been in isolation. And in fact, it's not in isolation. It's part of a general ecosystem and the same share of wallet of the consumer. So we really have to start broadening the perspective on fast and look at hybrid models, look at the totality of the touch points of the consumer where they consume content, video content online. And I'm really pleased that you brought up the, the TikTok example mm. because consumer behavior on TikTok, particularly when it comes to monetization um, and on social Instagram has changed quite a lot. And that behavior has yet to be adopted into the longer form video, but we will see that happening as well. And we will see, therefore, um, you know, at the moment, there is not a lot of um, parallel between behaviors on social and moving those people across to longer form videos, including fast, but all of that as those generations moved to fast or to longer form video is gonna morph. Important right. therefore to, to look at it contextually as a whole. Guy, sorry. Yeah, sorry, can I offer a small voice of dissent? Um, ah, what a surprise. <laughs> before I do that, um, I, I think definitions are important because even in the industry, I think there's multiple ways of uh, thinking about what fast is. To, to us, fast is a linear delivered stream. Um, uh, and therefore has parallels to traditional linear TV. What it does not inc include is on-demand delivery. Mm -hmm. um, and, and with that said, I think our, our Ampere's forecasts are somewhat lower than Omdia's. So we, we think the current market value is about a third of what Maria was showing um, by that definition, and that's important. That's course, our definition but... as well. In fact, we yeah. have very detailed metrics on what is advertising, what is on demand, and what is not on demand for every single platform in the world. We have yeah. analyzed the linear revenues for fast and completely separate the on-demand advertising revenues. Yeah, have as, have, as, have, as have we, and we, we put the yeah. value at about a third of what you've got it at. Um, so that's one thing, but not to underplay the importance of fast. Um, because I think, but but that said, I think FAST as an acronym will not exist in 24 months' time, in two years' time. Okay. Um, I think it's simply a temporary um, sort of junction in the road on the transition of free television to streaming um, and a way of describing a certain subsegment of the free streaming market. And I think that Consumers probably don't think in the same terms that we maybe do as industry analysts, where we have to divide and segment everything. Um, they care about two things. How do they watch? Is it linear or on demand? Um, and do they pay for it or do they not pay for it? And, and that's frankly all an end consumer cares about. So I think we're going to come on to this topic in some of the other things we're going to talk about um, in terms of what goes around, comes around. But I think we're simply going back to free TV, pay TV. And, and I, yeah, I'd, I'd add, yeah, I'd, uh, it's great points. I'd add, I'd add two things to, I think, the previous comments. Um, one is a little bit on the, the sort of cohort debate, I think, if, if that's what we can call it. Um, I, by happenstance, have a, have a slide. I haven't prepared to share it. Um, I'll try. And if I fail... Uh, I'll just. You're the right uh, person to be talking about this, Jonathan. I'll just, I'll just give up. Yeah. Yes, because, because Jonathan, as I said in my presentation, the US is very different from the rest of Europe, where you have fantastic public service broadcasters. For sure. But, but let me start with, with cohorts. So perhaps you can see a slide now. Um, yes. Brilliantly. Uh, okay, so I managed to use technology. That's a, that's a bit of a win. So that we've always had this, this debate in media about um, behavioral trends over the, over the long term. 
um, and whether young people will just pick up the the habits of the old. Now, this is not short form versus long form. Um, so, Natalie, I'm not saying your earlier comment was incorrect, um, but what I what I am saying is that. There's very, very clear evidence that um, uh, young audiences do not pick up the habits of older audiences, and it's due to the platforms that they use. You can take that in either way. So you could say, yes, but long form is more, more involving, more functional as, as content itself. And as they old and find content that is more valuable for them, they will move to long form. I think that would certainly be a case. But there's also an argument to be made that, that the kind of the formative habits that, that we experience in, in our youth um, carry forwards and, and certainly uh, the millennial and the Gen Z uh, generations, um, millennials especially, showed a bit of a, a transference to traditional patterns um, when they were sort of, uh, you know, moving into their first homes and buying their first TVs and this sort of thing around age 25 um but after that kind of just they just gave up um, so they went back to traditional or oh, traditional traditional for them um digital consumption habits so you know you could you could make the argument that in fact the evidence is stacking up against um some of this transference and in fact that the short form remains in its place and I'll, and I'll stop showing my one and only slide for today um the second point was as maria has um has correctly pointed out um i'm i'm here representing the broadcasters um so for them fast is a bit it's a bit weird um because it's this brand new shiny um uh, we'll call it a business model perhaps um that is exactly the same as as how tv looked in the sort of late 90s with uh, with a long list of thematic channels that you could access and had a lot of annoying advertising breaks so it's it's kind of the same thing as that it's just delivered over ip the difference for broadcasters is that somebody else owns the platform um and somebody else is monetizing it um and that somebody may in fact be a competitor and the second part is that at the same time any eyeball that you engage on somebody else's linear platform is not an eyeball that you're engaging on your own platform. Now, the EBU has a, has a really diverse member base. Um, so for some of our members, that's not necessarily a worry for them. Um, for some of them, it is. So there's no sort of singular strategy for, for broadcasters out there. But it is very important for, for our members to, to consider um, what they're really kind of really long term players here. Um, do they want to sacrifice maybe a few views? And, and as Maria is so fond of saying, maybe a few millions um, <laughs> now um, for the sort of longevity of their platform and building a sort of sustainable um, own platform experience of themselves because they can pretty much you know create fast like experiences by by simulcasting um, their uh, their linear channels onto onto that own platform so two two thoughts there oh, sorry there's one more important point there Jonathan um in the 90s an analog um, satellite transponder least cost about a million quid a year. Um, a fast channel costs about, as we heard during my panel in NEM a couple of weeks ago, about 4,000 a month to get off the ground. Um, so that's a very significant uh, difference in investment. And of course, a, 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 a satellite transponder or a cable system is geographically limited. Um, a stream delivery is not. So very significant cost. Of, and that's one of the reasons there's so much interest in fast, of course, but that said, monetary. Oh, you've broken up. Uh, we lost a guy. I think he's Over geographically limited. Yeah. You don't have good connectivity. <laughs> uh, sorry, <laughs> I, 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 I was like, saying. I think Guy was making the point about monetization. Yes. Yeah, monetization so, is very yeah. challenging as well. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so yeah. as we are on the content monetization, uh, as we've kind of all just noticed, the, the model keep the models keep evolving. So, you know, in a way it keeps evolving in a very organic way. Where do you think we are currently heading for? What are those, apart from fast, obviously, what are those kind of the, the key monetization trends? Natalie, what, what's your view here? Well, I think this is a, a good place to evolve from what we've just talked about. Uh, first of all, I'm coming from live from Khan Lion, which is the place where everyone's talking about that and the use of tech to optimize that and the use of programmatic and it's the obsession at the moment. Um, it, to step back, um, monetization models are evolving. Uh, there isn't a single one. It's a hybrid uh, situation. We've seen um, 
the SVOD model as a, a very strong and preferred model for some uh, studios, and they've now sort of looked at a hybrid model. Uh, the challenge with the AVOD model or the FAST model is that the CPMs or the, you know, the, the value attributable to them are variable. And of course, the ad market is uh, soft, has softened and is softening, uh, anticipated to soften over the next year or two. So it's not insulating content owners and channel suppliers from uh, a dip in revenues. Uh, so um, uh, that being said, with the introduction of um, broadcaster-led fast services and premium fast, what I would call premium category fast services and AVOD, uh, premium AVOD <laughs> services like Netflix, I think we're going to see probably a, a, a more complex um, uh, advertising uh, um, in, in ecosystem for both fast and AVOD where we will see uh, variable rates according to the, the type of the inventory. It'll be very interesting to see the impact of premium inventory on the type of revenue that can be generated in fast versus now. Um, the programmatic inventory that's coming through isn't uh, always optimized, particularly if the brands are not very well known or the content isn't premium content. Um, so for me, the what I'm fascinated by is I think we're seeing technology catch up and we're now seeing uh, a whole new area of opportunities for commerce beyond just the traditional um, subscription or um, advertising model into what's called content commerce. And I think we're going to see a lot of evolution coming that way. What is content commerce? Well, it's essentially the ability to transact and to make a commercial transaction at the point of inspiration inside uh, a piece of content that you are engaged with. And that behavior, that behavior already exists. Going back to our earlier conversation, that behavior already exists on TikTok and on Instagram. And it is driving a lot of the revenue that Maria was talking about. So why wouldn't other parts of the ecosystem, namely Fast or others, uh, look to that behavior and try and replicate it for themselves and, and, and build out a third revenue stream. So I think that is what, uh, what will be exciting to watch as well. And that will also, I suspect, impact revenue forecasts that Maria and Diana yeah. were talking about. I, I agree, Natalie, with you. And I want to add another point. So we're talking a lot about advertising. We just wrote a report saying the future is hybrid. Everyone in the pay sector will be involved in one way or another in free in advertising and also launching something around fast but i would like also to to talk about monetization of ip those who exactly. hold ip they can exploit it across different windows different platforms we are talking a lot about the last of us and like if it's something new and again it's something really old but now is the perfect timing to exploit it better to exploit ip across books across movies across theatrical TV series. Netflix was the first one doing lots of TV series. Before The Last of Us, they were very famous shows. And now all of them, uh, all the streamers are launching uh, content based on games IP because they know the, the fans are very loyal and they will follow the game everywhere. And vice versa. I know, Jonathan, you have a lot to say about that as well. But and vice versa. And again, fantastic opportunity to make money through merchandising. Yeah. Uh, in Which Japan, it's exactly a content commerce, doesn't it? Yes. It goes back to the IP, the content commerce. We have a lot to also learn from gaming as well. Exactly, right. Natalie. For, for example, in Japan, when they create IP, they're already thinking in every single window at once. So when they're launching a new series, like this Unamai, uh, these women that look like horses, when they create the, the IP, they create the TV series, the theatrical, the cinema, the concert, the t-shirts, the books, everything at once. So all the production companies, all the different units comes together. They create like a, a group of companies to exploit that IP across everything. The publicity, yeah. the social media, the opportunities are huge. In Europe, it will be difficult to do that. Um, well, there's, there's, there's the, you know, the, the, you're right. It's, it's not the same. Uh, you don't get the, quite the same multimedia uh, con consumption of, of content as you do in Japan. But there are some really interesting examples where you, you have seen that sort of franchise system come up. Uh, I've taken to calling it the sell more cake strategy, which is, uh, you know, if you look at certain properties, there's a, there's a, there's a German company, uh, Kinnix, um, who have made more money selling cake than they have selling uh, the, the TV show, uh, effectively, because as soon as you've you've built the, the captive audience, you 
you then have um, you then have a way in. And, and it's in. I think the main shift there may, maybe is, is, isn't exactly focusing on 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 the merchandise, but perhaps if you're if you're a leader, you should be considering that the the way you think about your business is no longer um, as selling TV content, but in fact, what you are doing is you're owning a relationship with an end user or a consumer. Um, and you have that channel through which you can communicate to them. Um, so if the, the way they are familiar to communicate with you is, is around sort of, um, you know, TV shows or something, that's that's fantastic. But, um, you know, in imagining, you know, um, a way that you can digitally contact them um, and bring new uh, sort of facets of that IP to them um, is sort of a, a sort of structural change in, in one of the ways we can we can envision yeah things going forward the other thing to add to that is is just that the um you know when you start off a, a particular piece of ip with a captive audience you massively lower the risk um so there's a, there's a good case there to be made for sort of more high value stuff which won't which won't <laughs> collapse you know, game of thrones can I, example. can I just um i think i think we should give not netflix credit for ut um utilizing ip disney did it yeah i was going to say disney having been before. there at the time and, and being and, an executive and, that, that, that's exactly. their whole model. But I think it, it's a good is. segue into something I wanted to say about business models, which is I think what we're seeing in the industry is a case of what goes around comes around. As we're seeing some retrenchment in streaming investment content wise, yeah. um, we're seeing an opening up to some of the business models that had been closed temporarily when everyone went direct. And, and by that, I mean theatrical releasing, obviously COVID also had an impact there, but also licensing content to third parties. So a lot of these ways of making money are coming back to the fore where they temporarily uh, fell out of favour when people were holding back all their content, trying to build their own fiefdoms of direct-to-consumer streaming. And so we're at a very interesting juncture um, but those who've been watching the industry long enough will have seen it all before. Um, yeah. And it's very interesting that we have gone full circle again, yet again, because it yes, happens every 10 years or so. <laughs> yeah. except, except this time there is a difference, Guy, and it's a significant difference. Uh, we have networks, connections, community connections, networks that can drive yeah. a lot of the value of that. Sorry, I mean, Natalie, let me interrupt, apologies, because we actually have a question here from one of the uh, listeners. What do we think about the gaming content for fast channels, which effectively goes back to the value of IPs and how we are now trying to take those IPs and just reach the audiences without immediate monetization? Yeah. What are your views? Yeah, I'd, I'd say, you know, guys comment before, it's, it's $4,000 uh, 4, a month. Uh, to launch a fast channel and it lends itself spectacularly well to thematic experiences so you know gaming is something that's always struggled to find a spot on uh sort of mainstream tv certainly competing in a, in a sort of a linear spot against uh, big audiences gaming's never found its foot um, and also really struggled to build audiences in in the same ways that that say sports did i'm sort of segmenting here between um, sort of gaming as a as a hobby and gaming as a as, as a sport to some extent. So you know, fast it's a fantastic place for uh, gaming and gaming related content and esports. The word I was looking for uh, to really actually find its footing and start to build audiences in in a in a realistic way, not in a way that's that's sort of cynically supported by third party revenues, but in its own right. Brilliant. Thank you. Now, I, I was, so yeah. I was just going to make a quick point. I heard Kevin Hart who's a big Hollywood talent, talk about Heartbeat. And he has, in a very few years, built a massive machine to convert his brand into multiple revenue sources across, you know, from a film background originally across everything. And uh, he's a, an interesting model of where the industry is going, leveraging everything from social to TV to brand value to all sorts of things. Everything can be translated into fast. Gaming, sports, there are lots of sports services in fast. As I said before, social media, even all the courses we're doing in LinkedIn, they can be converted into fast. So anything we can imagine, any content can be translated into fast. So, okay, on the on the topic of sports, Maria, uh, as you say, if any content can be converted yeah. into, into yeah. fast, but what, yeah. what's happening with sports or especially 
recently, you know, talked a lot about the, the women's sports. Is it something that you see a huge future for in streaming? So two topics, sports and fast, super hot. All this, the main fast services, they have launched uh, sports fast uh, channels. So all of them, like Samsung, LG, Pluto, they all have sports services. Some of them also with live sports. So it's not just documentary or all catalog. It's live content also available in fast. And you mentioned also a very important topic that is women in sports. So if you don't mind, let me search you very quickly since this year is the Women's uh, World Cup. Let me show you very quickly uh, this slide. <coughs> really, I love the slides. So this, I love the slides because then you can see data. So it's not just talking from the air. This is data showing you the media rights for women's leagues. You can see here tennis looks huge, 52 a million is in fact one of the sports rights that generates more value, followed by women's college, women's NBA, a cricket, and then football. Football is quite low for women, 8.3, the Women's Super League, Champions League, 7.4. So this is women sports. Do we think these numbers are high? Well, I said that women tennis is high, 52. Next to men is very small, it's three times less. Men's tennis rights is ATP 165. But what about other sports? Look at the Premier League, the difference between women and men. The men's rights are 563 times more expensive. I think this is really crazy. That is 563 times more expensive. And when I put here all the sports together, especially in football, the difference is huge. So we do think the value of women's rights are many times undervalued. I think it's the perfect time to acquire them because, yes, there is an appetite. I have many more slides to show you, showing how, for example, in England, thanks to the victory last year, the appetite for consuming that content multiplied by 10. Women and men want to watch this kind of sports. Because so do you, do you see a leveling up, uh, Maria, of that, therefore, over time? For sure, it will. it will take long, long time to, to level up. We need all organizations to be involved. In the case of football, for example, FIFA, UEFA, all these associations need to make sure the games are being broadcast as a, at times where people will watch them. They need support from everyone. But there is an appetite. People want to watch that content. So I think some of the rights for men are too expensive and uh, the opposite for women. I think some of them are uh, undervalued. So... And then some of his, of his sports, again, Jonathan, you can comment here, but the Olympics is a sport that women love. 60% men, 40% women. is one of the most sports that women like to watch, together with others that you can see here. So my quote will be, it's the perfect time to invest to acquire women's sports. Not because it's something nice to do, it's because there is an appetite. And the appetite is increasing. This year is the Women's World Cup. So we need to pay attention to this because there is a lot of money behind and we, uh, if you want to make money, jump on this. And in fast, again, there are companies like Rakuten doing lots of documentaries following the life of female athletes, which are in fact very, very popular. Mm -hmm. uh, the number of documentaries in sports have multiplied after the pandemic. People are very curious to follow the lives of others, in particular, the lives of sports celebrities their wives, their children, everyone. And if you do this around women athletes, it's an opportunity to also increase awareness of that particular sport. But since I mentioned the Olympics, Jonathan, probably you want to comment because well, yeah. I know the EBU, congratulations, you have achieved massive milestones there. Thank you, Maria. It was uh, my colleagues in the, the building behind me, uh, namely Glenn, who were so instrumental in, in landing that. Um, you know, you talked you talked about value uh, a few times there, and, and then finalised with, with with awareness. I think that's um, I think that's key to to how we operate. You know, um, when we look at the value of something, it's not necessarily the the uh, the fiscal value. Um, and I think public broadcasters in general, just flagging this, uh, have been pretty good at recognising the value of, of women's sports for a very long time, and it's just the uh, more commercial. Uh, members of our community who are only just re uh, beginning to, to realize the, the immense value there. Um, and also, you know, building awareness of, of these sports is, is something that's taken a lot of time. 
Um, and I would, would flag that, you know, even despite perhaps smaller audiences, uh, our members have always been pretty good at, at making women's sport available during slots that maybe would have seen uh, larger audiences elsewhere. So, um, you know, I think uh, EBU members in general have been pretty good at, at recognising the value of women's sports in the past. And, and only now are we beginning to see uh, sort of competition um, from, from commercial players. And it's uh, it's something that free to air television to make uh, to build on your point, Jonathan, is very good at is um, building a fan base for a sport. Once you've gone on to pay <laughs> TV, of course, exclusively, your your audience is limited by nature to to those who have access, and that's um, one of the ways that one can build uh, demand for a sport is by using free to air as a key part of the overall strategy and obviously premier league etc are wedded these days to or always in fact to mm. pay tv there's the cricket and formula one are good examples of, of that i think i think they both started on, on free to air and now have entered the, the pay model and now they've built these audiences a little and, bit and, sad for those who, who didn't manage to pay yeah. for it and, 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 no and jonathan you mentioned formula one but it was thanks to the documentary that then drive lots of viewers to follow the sport so that's why I'm saying the power of documentaries. Well, yes, you say that, but they had more viewers when they were on Channel 4. But after the documentary, they increased <laughs> new viewers and they never watched it before. Very true, very true. Just, just to say, I do agree with Guy that probably in a couple of years that the term fast will stop existing and it will be just yet another way of accessing content because effectively it's whatever is the distribution mode, it's very much... You know, the eyeballs follow where the content leads and it's all about then a viewing experience and how smooth, how easy it will be to to view that content on fast. So I completely agree yeah. that it's, you know, fast is the There's one fundamental difference, though, and that fast is driven by programmatic and programmatic advertising and uh, and uh, so it becomes a data game and it's a very different, therefore, experience to linear for that reason so let's see how that evolves yeah. over the next 12 to 24 months because that will of course color how the consumer sees the experience yeah. thank you so now moving to yet another extremely hot topic these days which is the uh, chat gpt Following its recent arrival, the media industry seems to be heading in a completely unknown direction. You know, we all hear about the loss of jobs. You know, question on everybody's lips is how is uh, AI going to really impact our industry? Um, Jonathan, I believe you've had some thoughts about it. Um, I do. Um, where, where to start? We're in, we're in a slightly fortunate position um, at, at the EBU because uh, we have a, a lovely department called Technology and Innovation um, who picked up on on this as a trend quite a quite a quite a while ago. So um, they've been looking at this for, for five years. So so firstly, uh, thanks to our TNI department, I know more than I would have otherwise. Um, I think uh, at the start of this year, we only really started to, to realize what a massive impact this is this is having on. Uh, how we do business in media and it's fundamentally about the accessibility of these these ai tools you know the last five years have been great there's some amazing things that you can do in terms of production um, and even in distribution and sort of risk uh, risk avoidance in in sort of edge networking and that kind of thing um, but they're technically very very difficult um, and the fundamental change is just how accessible um sort of fairly sophisticated ai tools have become um Where's it going to affect us? You know, I think what you, what did you start with directions unknown. I think that's spot on. Um, what we do know is that it's going to impact uh, kind of every aspect of what we do. So if you look at a, a typical, um, you know, breadth of the the what a media organisation can do, everything from production through distribution, um, through uh, the sort of delivery of that content in terms of discovery, can have an AI application. But then, of, of course, the other thing we need to think about again is how it changes how we work on, a, on, a, on an organizational or a structural basis. Um, there are certain ways that we interact with our colleagues in a workspace that will change um, due to the way that AI tools will uh, enable sort of new uh, tools. There are skills that we have that we won't need. Um, there are certain trainings that will be expedited um, and there are sort of functions that will, will not exist and some that will be new. Um, so roughly <laughs> it affects everything we're doing. Um, 
<clears throat> it has some severe uh, organizational questions for leaders. Um, it has a range of implications on the content that we produce and the content that we will consume, as well as how we find and interact with it. Um, so I, I think one of the interesting areas is in the creative process. Um, if you're here in LA, you'll be well aware of the writer's strike, although it seems to have fallen out of the news a bit. One of the key issues that the writers are taking task with is use of AI or potential use of AI in screenwriting and in the creative process. Um, I'm, I think it's fast. I think that's a very difficult negotiation point. Um, well, to be, to be fair, I think it's a bit like the boy at the dam and the finger in the dam. I mean, the horse has bolted. AI is being used to create content. The question is not uh, is not how they phrased it. To be absolutely honest, I have immense sympathy for them. But you know, I've also listened to the other side of that, which is that uh, AI in the creative process is democratizing the creative process and then giving access to people to build on what is there. And so for a script writer, uh, it's also creating opportunities, uh, not yeah. just uh, but, restrictions. I'm, yes, I'm but the contention is that it's copyright um, because what AI is doing, and this is the same in the world of still photography, is sourcing content from the internet. It's the scraping um, that's the issue. It's the scraping um, of, of so content. It's using and someone AI. else's original IP to morph into a new creation, which strictly is not copyright infringement. That, yeah, that, that's, that, that's part of the that's so, part of the issue that we need to look at, yes. What I would like to add, talking about events we have been on and topics, last week I was seeing a fantastic event in France, Diva Tech, and had the pleasure to be there with Elon Musk. <laughs> yes, you <laughs> saw. <laughs> no, the, the event is fantastic for everyone listening. If you want to go to Paris next year, go. The event is really well organized. Uh, also, go to London Tech Week, organized by Informa. But Viva Tech was really spectacular. And Elon Musk was, as you all know, very negative about AI. Uh, he said it's the most transformative technology ever, but it will end up killing us all, despite him in investing himself in AI before and even now. But some people are very worried. It can kill us. It, it will be something really bad. It needs to be regulated for sure. But some platforms in our industry talking about media, uh, Natasha my, uh, from Sahit in the Middle East put a post saying how Sahit has introduced Sahit GPT. Yes. So you can interact. Exactly. With, yes, it, it is very interesting. You interact with your TV. And you're saying, I want to watch an Arabic comedy in less than one hour with three Spanish actors. ChatGPT gives you options. So I think it will be very good uh, for content recommendations, for interacting with your TV, because we're talking about fast streaming. There are thousands, more than 10,000 streaming video services, thousands of fast services. How do people find content these days? It's complicated. So again, AI will transform many things, creative processes, Finding that content, uh, and again, I don't. I think Jonathan, uh, I saw you saying this quote once from someone. Uh, AI will not replace humans, but those humans who know how to use AI definitely will replace those who don't. So again, for everyone listening, let's study, let's put, uh, uh, improve our skills because everyone needs to make sure they are using it because there are benefits, and we should all be aware what those benefits are rather than boycotting them or saying it's going to kill us if we don't even know what they can do for us. So, so yeah. prompting is a new skill that we all have to acquire, how yeah. to prompt properly. Apologies. I, I think that's, that's true for, sorry. Uh, <laughs> I think just have another okay. live question, and if you don't mind. So somebody actually going back to content curation, which Maria has just touched on. There's a question about CTVs and uh, whether broadcasters should partner with the CTV companies, uh, which basically seems to be the next curations. Personally, my view is that the, the CTVs actually do need pay TV channels, broadcasters, because they are the ones who actually are good content curators. CTVs are more content aggregators. But, you know, what's your view on that? Yeah. Isn't, it, isn't it a question of how technology enables that? And also, 
at what point of, uh, there is metadata capture that enables that? Uh, is it becoming more sophisticated? Are we moving beyond the old text-based uh, metadata capture to a whole range of things? I have seen some amazing applications of search and recommendation, which, uh, which yeah, there we go. Um, which uh, thank you, Maria. Um, I, I have data for everything for every question. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> um, but the, the point the point there, I think there's a simple point there, and everyone can feel free to chip in. Which is, um, it's uh, you know, I, I think you know, it really depends on uh, how technology enables all of that on CTV, and you know. Yeah. I don't think that necessarily the pay TV channels have the um, they know how to curate now with the current technology that they've known and operated on, but they don't necessarily have the monopoly on that. So it depends on the agility of um, the CTV manufacturers and others to implement solutions that actually enable a good consumer experience and a one that is search searchable, including voice activated and others. I think that's perfectly right. And I think uh, additionally, I, I actually have a slide as well to share. Um, okay. I, if I, could I like this slide. The... Yeah, this is like yeah. Jonathan starts with his. It says how complex the CTV landscape is, where everyone wants to be involved. Online video providers, broadcasters, pay TV operators. Yeah. Uh, the companies that they used to make money I selling agree. TVs, now they realize they make more money with services because hard work is expensive. So profits come from services, not from selling the TVs. So the connected TV world is complicated and everyone wants to take a bit of that. Yeah. So my point is, is kind of going back to uh, 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 Natalie's point around metadata, which is everybody's favorite topic. Um, what, what I've kind of done here is, is, is had had some thoughts around what actually goes on with metadata um, and what goes on with audience data and how the two things interact if you're forming partnerships or not forming partnerships. Um, so the question's roughly about CTV, um, but at the moment CTV has various apps on it and there may or may not be a hard wall between what happens with audience data within that. And then fundamentally, if an app is not sharing audience data with the CTV platform, um, the, the CTV platform doesn't know any more about what's going on um, than what's on the app. So I've, I've come up with roughly four, four ideas of what could happen. Um, if there is a unified portal, um, there are two roughly two ways that this, this could then develop. Um, either there is a single large aggregator, which is the, the CTV platform, but that is dependent on all metadata being entirely compatible and the same with audience data. Um, which is which is quite an ask and doesn't look that likely at any point when is the industry ever standardized around data quality. Um, and on the right hand side, you've got a sort of a, a multiple app um, sort of universe, which is probably more likely. Um, and then you have a nightmare scenario at the top, um, which is where um, the, the, the metadata is shared, but the audience data is not shared. So the content's everywhere. Um, but the audiences uh, can't find it. And I have called that Mad Mickelson everywhere. Um, he's a he's a lovely Scandinavian actor, um, where he's he's roughly on every every platform, but nobody's really sure who's who's watching him. Um, so it's it's a range of of different sort of uh, scenarios which may develop. What's the most likely? I don't see um, I don't see uh, ubiquitous search actually becoming uh, apparent for the mainstream, but I do see it being um, increasingly prevalent for the sort of major players, so the main CDT manufacturers doing deals with the main um, sort of uh, subscription services um, to make sure that their content is, is rising to the top. And then a scattering of sort of a slightly chaotic mix of, of what's available everywhere else. Uh, I'll stop sharing and let other people talk. Yeah, I'm really sorry, but literally that's all we have time for. <laughs> Even though we could just sit here and listen to all of you for much, much longer. Uh -huh. Uh, thank you so much to everyone. I want to bring my friend here. He wanted to say hello very quickly. <laughs> hello. Oh, your surprise guest. I was my surprise guest. Here he is. Oh, hey. we wanted to see Theo, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, everybody. That was fascinating. It was really, really good. Um, and uh, loving the slides, both slides. I loved it from one movement to the next movement. So, gracias, Maria. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, we really appreciate your time putting it together. And Kasia, thank you for the questions and the moderation. If anybody's got any further questions, you can email info at ctameurope.com. And if any of the members wish to see the 
recording again, that will be on the members only section of ctamurup.com. So thank you all again, same time next year, hey, for the annual Fantastic Five discussion. <laughs> so thanks, everyone. Send your questions <laughs> in if you have. Fantastic Six now, now that yeah. Theodore is here. <laughs> <laughs> See you all soon. Thanks very much. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.